So, um, I am based at the University of Melbourne in the School of Psychology. Most of the work I do is using uh, cognitive neuroscience methods, particularly functional MRI and EEG. Uh, and I'll try and give you some of the, the kind of core principles that I hope um, are useful in terms of how the brain learns. Uh, and I always like to make people work. So the first thing that I, I like to start this talk off with is uh, a memory test. And so I'm going to present to you some items. I don't want you to write them down. I want you to try and keep them uh, in your memory. Uh, so I'm going to ask you about them later on. I'm just going to present them uh, one at a time. I'm going to talk over the top of them to make it even harder. I see anyone writing them down, I'll let you choose it. Okay, so hold on to those if you can for later on. <laughs> if you can. Uh, so in terms of the core concepts, uh, uh, coming from a psychological background, often uh, the basic neuroscience principles are not necessarily um, that clear. And I think one of the, the kind of key pieces of information to give people. concepts this idea of um, that neurons communicate using both electrical and chemical signals. And I think um, we, we often hear in the news media about the plasticity of the brain and certainly when I started in psychology, uh, particularly neuropsychology, which is the clinical field that I work in, that when people had brain injuries, that one of the reasons there were you know, profound psychological problems and, and cognitive problems was because of the brain didn't repair itself. And while that is partly true, what we know now is that there, the brain is capable of plastic changes, um, that because this is a chemical and electrical signal um, process, that you can um, have rewiring uh, in the brain. Uh, that's, uh, while we like to think that each of us is individually um, unique, uh, there is a level of genetic determination about how our nervous systems work um, and that we need to keep in mind that there's a lot of similarity in the way that we do things but also a level of individual variability. Um, and depending on the, the kind of core process or cognitive process that we're interested in, there can be a tremendous amount of uh, Also important to remember that our life experiences have a dramatic effect on the nervous system. And I've kind of listed up there um, some of the ones that, for example, I've been doing research on, so drug dependence, um, how it interacts with our uh, experiences and our ability to uh, learn new information. Uh, and it's always important to try and understand individual differences in those of the, that we're trying to teach information to. Likewise, the salience of an event any learning event um, will determine how well we retain that information. Uh, and there's various things that we can do to enhance the salience uh, of that information, taking into account these, um, these types of effects. That what learning is actually doing uh, in the human brain is uh, strengthening a set of electrical and chemical events level of individual neurons, which obviously we can't see, um, but that over time result in functional associations that get distributed throughout the brain. And while we um, 
traditionally we used to think that there were certain centers in the brain that were memories were held. We now know that actually information and retention occurs throughout the brain. And it's this process of uh, synaptic association that actually is the foundation of memories. Uh, and the act of remembering actually opens up uh, that synap synaptic set for further plasticity, further change. And because our memories are formed uh, synchronously, uh, from synchronously active but sparse connections uh, within the human brain, uh, that's why uh, there's an associative nature to memory and why there are obviously imperfections. Okay, so to go back to my memory test, um, I'm going to try and write down as many of the items that I gave you before. The order of them is important. Am I getting any extra marks for getting the order up? This is good practice because this is one of the things we do uh, as part of um, the CADM, so the Cognitive Dementia Assessment Memory Services. So people who have suspected dementia, this is one of the things we do, do with people. Not this specific one. Don't remember it for later, it won't happen. Not that I'm suspicious that any of you are dementia, quite the opposite. But we know one of the things that helps us for these types of activities is actually having taken these types of tests before uh, reduces anxiety and therefore increases. Now that you've written down the list, I'm going to read out a recognition list and I just want you to write down or uh, put a tick uh, next to any of the items that you think were on the list. If it, even if you didn't recall it, uh, just tell me whether or not you think it might have been on that list. Uh, rest. Tired. Snore. Night. Daydream, pillow, sheet, and sleep. Now I'm going to come back to that list again uh, later on. Hopefully to demonstrate something I've been trying to say. So learning. Um, sensory processing is this integration between emotional states and emotional planning. Um, remembering an event, fact, procedure reactivates the same set of synapses in the brain uh, that previously occurred. Uh, and that process uh, of remembering information uh, reopens the initial plasticity uh, along with the probability of reinforcing or weakening of that activation pattern. So in terms of information, one of the questions we're often interested in is why do I remember certain things and I'm not able to recall others? Even though I feel like I've processed both of those pieces of information in an equal way. And one of the questions um, neuroscience had was, you know, if you've processed information, is it necessarily stored in the brain or was it in the store? And the answer to that question appears to be that even information that we can't necessarily recall is stored in the brain. And the issue tends to be that the ability to retrieve that information is based upon the strength of these associations that were initially laid down at the point of processing the information. And as a consequence, um, the variability in our memories, the unreliability, uh, nature of them, is why we forget these in consequence from the daily details, you know, the, the salience of the information the processing and the elaborative nature of the processing we do on that information affect whether or not it's able to be recalled. Um, we don't store information in memory as a literal recording. It's not like our VCRs or CD um, storage devices. Um, we record information, if you like, by relating information to things that have meaning for us. Um, and so as a consequence, we have to be an active participant in that learning process. 
So passive learning strategies, reading information, reading notes, tend to be very inefficient processes for learning information, particularly new information. And unfortunately why listening to things in your sleep and other very passive processes tend not to be particularly efficient. Um, but also as a consequence, our information or our capacity for storing information is essentially unlimited. Um, and that storing information in memory actually creates capacity because of the new opportunities it provides for creating new associations. Um, so you can't fill up memory for better or worse. Um, if information gets encoded in memory, uh, it will generally remain stored. Uh, though the problem always is it's not necessarily accessible. Um, and so accessing that information is not we should also think of accessing that information as not a playback. Um, but it's a fallible process that includes inferring and reconstructing information based on the initial association that we made. Um, and we, there's plenty of research now to show that when we recall the past, you know, we're driven unconsciously by um, our, our recollections and our biases at the time of processing. And one of the good examples that people use uh, in the US in particular is they've asked people uh, to recall their experiences of seeing the first, um, you know, on the day of 9-11, the first time they saw the footage of the first plane flying into the World Trade Center. And people can give very elaborate explanations of where they were, when they saw it, what they remember seeing. Uh, and at a point, the experimenter will explain to them that actually the footage of that first plane was never shown on 9-11, in fact, it wasn't shown until several months later. And yet people's recollection of that event is very um, sincere, they you know, have a, a strong familiarity with that information. Um, and, but the, the unreliability of memory and the ability to associate those things um, is unreliable. Um, but Similarly, the, I guess the take-home message from this is that retrieving information is actually a process by which we improve the recallability of information. Uh, in fact, there's a, a technique used in dementia uh, called uh, retrieval-induced uh, forgetting. We try and um, get people, so one of the issues with dementia, for example, is that people ask you the same question over and over again. And for carers, it can be quite frustrating difficult because no matter how many times um, you provide the answer, it's not encoded in memory. And one of the ways to, to get around that is to ask them the question and get them to provide the answer to it. Uh, and once they can do that, gradually increasing the period of time over which you ask that question to ensure that that information can be accurately recorded. So in summary, to create durable and flexible access to information you want to learn, um, you need to achieve that initial uh, meaningful encoding uh, that gets based upon a broader framework of already known or interrelated concepts, and then you need to practice the retrieval process over an increasing duration of time, um, from minutes to hours to weeks to months, uh, if you want to. Uh, and to kind of give you a contextual example, for all of those of you who have flown domestically or internationally, uh, you've probably seen the life jacket training video uh, you know, tens to hundreds of times. In terms of uh, giving people, uh, or getting them to learn that process, that's a very passive way of trying to train people to do things. It would actually be much more efficient than showing you hundreds of times to simply give you a life jacket and ask you to try putting it on once. Obviously they don't get you to do that because of the anxiety that it would provoke in a lot of people, but it's an example of where sometimes the way we present information is constrained and that adversely affects our ability to learn that information. So, one of the things that we often don't pay a lot of attention to, uh, and I speak here of universities in particular, is uh, knowing or teaching our students how to manage learning activities, um, and in particular, knowing where they're likely to fail in terms of their understanding of their own learning uh, processes. Um, 
And what education, research, and psychological research has shown is that our introspections and intuitions about our own uh, are a particularly unreliable guide as to how we should actually manage our own learning. Um, so, for example, when we're managing, um, so one of the things that people need to do is to manage the conditions uh, of their learning. So, for example, the space rather than mass uh, study particular to be learned topics. Um, often our intuition is that we should stick to one topic until we feel like we've got it and then move on to the next one. Actually, the evidence suggests the opposite, that you would better switch between things right, in an interleaved way. Um, that you need to vary the conditions under which you learn and retrieve you know, in order to create a, a, a richer or more elaborate experience of associations for that information. So um, you get a whole lot of new cues to recall when you make those associations and recall them in different environments. And if you think about your own learning, um, if you've been able to learn something in, in multiple different environments, chances are you have a better ability to recall it. And I think one of the, the difficulties in particular we have this issue with, with university students is that typically these strategies will have short-term costs. And so you're having to argue the merit of the students when they can see that immediately it's going to take them more time or there's going to be greater processing costs in order to do this. Um, and there will be this initial slowing of the rate of learning. Um, we don't uh, formally train certainly not at the university level, uh, the use of effective strategies. Um, There's kind of an assumption, again, at the tertiary level, that um, we should be teaching content rather than these types of um, process information. Um, and students, students' own experience uh, sometimes leads them to believe uh, that ineffective strategies are actually more effective. Uh, so, there's a nice example from a study by Paul Now showing that um, if you ask high school students um, what type of uh, space versus mass practice, um, which one is better, 90% of them will say they had better performance with the space. Um, but 72% of the students rated the mass practice, practice as more effective. So even though you know, the evidence suggests one thing when you look at it objectively, the own perception was that the mass practice was a far more efficient way to learn the information. And one of the key kind of drivers of that effect is this illusion of the ease of process. The easier you make information to process, the greater our likelihood that we'll think that we've made that information. So even a change in the size of the font on PowerPoint slides uh, to ease the amount of processing will influence the individual's likelihood of saying that we made that information but has actually no um, demonstrable effect on their ability to record. Um, so we need to take that uh, into consideration. In terms of the strategy uh, for study, uh, so many students are not formally trained. So I want to bring you back to my memory test as a kind of way to exemplify uh, some of these things. Um, I want you to, having done the recognition test before and also the memory test, I want you to decide whether each of these words was on the original list that I showed you. I just put a tick next to each of the items. that list, is there one item on there that uh, anyone is 100% sure is on there? Which item? Does anyone, does anyone want to put their hand up to sleep? Okay, so uh, you can put how confident you are, but I'll skip to the next bit because I'm running out of time. So, 
The green ones are the items that are on the list, the red ones were not items. The red ones were actually items that might have been included on the initial test. So when people do this test, um, when this is done experimentally, the reason I ask about sleep is it's the most commonly produced word that actually wasn't on the list. The reason being is it fits nicely with the content of the other words. It seems like it's a word that ought to be on the list. It associates very nicely with lots of the other salient pieces of information that I was giving you. And if you ask people to recall that, so by getting you to do the recognition list, if you'd initially said yes to sleep, you'd be far more likely to recall it there as well because I've strengthened the association by asking you to recall it, even though it's a false piece of information. So one of the issues we have in education is if people have already got a false piece of information that they've learned, trying to get them to forget that information and actually learn the correct one actually becomes more difficult because that association is already strengthened. If you like. And it's one of the challenges that in the Science of Learning Centre we want to try and understand what at the neuroscience level are the most effective ways to try and dispel or remove these interfering pieces of pre-learning. I think that is me. Thank you. Uh, we'll have a chance for questions at the end, so I'm just going to carry on at this point and talk about um, one particular uh, effect in a bit more detail. Um, I'm going to talk to you about uh, test-enhanced learning. Um, when I talk about tests, I'm not talking about the kinds of um, summative tests, you know, like the end-of-year test. I'm talking about the kind of tests that are embedded, um, formative assessments, embedded assessments, whatever you uh, choose to call them. But I want to look at this uh, particular effect, it's a, uh, called the testing effect, and what it means and what it means for students and their own study. So I'm going to just talk to you about one particular study that was done that illustrates this. Um, it was conducted in 2006 by Henry Rodiger and Jeffrey Karpik at the uh, Washington University in St. Louis, Missouri, in the US. And it's just one of many experiments that they've conducted on this topic, but I'm just giving it to you as an illustration because it's a nice, clear one. Uh, it involved uh, looking at university students, and they were divided into two groups, and both groups were to learn some science facts from a written passage. So they both read the passage, and then the first group got to reread the passage, and the second group uh, got to do a recall where they had to just write down what they remembered from the uh, piece that they had learned you know, of the science facts. Um, and then in the experiment, the groups were tested uh, for recall um, five minutes after they had finished, uh, two days after, and one week later. So, hands up, who thinks that the study study group remembered the most? Hands up, who thinks the study test group remembered the most? Well, uh, actually skipping to the results, when you test the students immediately after in that five minute test, um, it was the study study group that actually were able to recall the most. Um, they scored 81% of items that they were able to recall compared to 75% for the study test group. And this sort of fits in with what Rob was talking about, like, uh, so this gives the impression that um, you're learning better, because if you test yourself immediately, um, you are doing better. And it might be why students believe that cramming for an exam is going to help them. But when you look at the results for two days later, um, the study only group had dropped from 81% recall to just 54% recall, which is a 27% drop. The um, study and test group had also dropped. Uh, but they only dropped 7% from 75% to 
And we see this pattern continues when he tested them a week later, uh, the performance of the study study group had dropped to 42%, which is uh, only 51% of their original score. Uh, in contrast, the study test group had dropped a bit more, um, but they only dropped 19% to a total of 56%, which is about a quarter of their original score. So when the study study group couldn't, it, you know, they dropped half uh, of their performance and the study test group dropped about a quarter. So over time, that testing yourself um, on the material that you've learned has long-lasting effects. And it's an effect that's well known. I mean, some of you may already have known this effect. Um, this is a quote from 1620, Francis Bacon, who said, um, if you read a piece of text through 20 times, you won't learn it by heart as easily as if you read it 10 times while attempting to recite from time to time uh, to, and then consulting the text when you don't remember. Uh, it's been shown as well in computer-mediated scientific explanations with adults, multiple choice questions in undergraduate lectures and in science quizzes with 13 to 14 year olds. So it's a robust, it's one of the most robust effects in uh, cognitive psychology. Um, what I want to do is to just, um, on our sort of neuroscience theme, delve into what might be the cause of that and what's the explanation. <coughs> Um, so it's been proposed that a um, uh, reason that it's, uh, you, have, you get better recall is because it's effortful learning, which ties in with what Rob was just saying, that you actually have to do something um, during your learning. Um, so if we look at what's going on in the brain that might support this, we might be able to understand it a bit better. Um, so, as Rob has told you, um, you know that during learning, uh, your brain is making the new connections between neurons uh, and uh, the formation of synapses. We know that as you process information, you're strengthening those connections and uh, also weakening ones that are not relevant and less important. So, re-engaging with the learning, newly learned material is important. But as we know from this study, uh, how you engage with it is um, important and that strengthening those neural connections is uh, better when you're testing. So if we look at cognitive psychology, there's some sort of hint as to why this might be happening. Um, so this is a very simplified model from a German researcher called Suzanne Narcis. Um, that she developed in 2006. Um, it's called the Interactive Two Feedback Loops, or ITFL model, because there's basically two loops. There's one that is focused in the learner, um, and what the learner's doing is, um, what we've been talking about so far, is um, processing his or her own reactions and interactions with the learning material. And then loop two, which is your area of um, the world. Uh, it's the external uh, feedback that a learner is getting. Uh, that's coming from a teacher or from a computer-based tutoring system, whatever, but um, there's some external feedback on the learning that's coming to them. So the learners having to process from both of those sources and there's quite a lot going on, so if we look at that in a little more detail, we can see um, why it might be more effortful to uh, test yourself. So, uh, Narcissus called uh, this process the internal controller, because it's happening in the mind of the learner. And what sorts of things are going on there? Well, one of the first things that uh, a learner has to do is process his or her own conception of the learning task, and also the internal feedback that they're getting as they're engaging with the material. Um, other research on how we respond to errors, which is one of the fields that um, Rob has looked at in particular, it shows that um, it's these kinds of comparisons between what we expect in the learning process and mismatches 
uh, with what actually happens that um, starts to uh, strengthen the learning. So there's, um, in, in addition to that internal loop, there's an external loop. So the um, external feedback um, is having to be processed by the learner. And then the learner's comparing his or her conception with the external feedback. Then they're comparing their own internal feedback with the external feedback. And then at the end of that sort of process, which might be a very quick process, uh, the learner's making a decision as to whether to engage in what Narciss calls a control action. Um, that, that might be um, correcting their error, if they notice they've made their own error, or asking for clarification. Um, so as you can see from this list, there's a lot going on in the learner's head. Uh, some of it's related to the internal feedback loop, is what we've just been talking about. So um, the good news about the testing effect is, uh, not only, only is it a positive effect, but you can enhance it as well. Um, so some things that are important to enhancing the effect are firstly the type of test that you use to test the knowledge. Um, so things like multiple choice and true false uh, don't work as well as um, open response, you know, a short written response or just writing down what you recall because there's more cognitive effort involved in doing those latter things than there is in just selecting uh, from a, a list of choices. Um, second thing is, um, and this was mentioned in Rob's first half, um, timing of the test uh, has some effect, although there have been some mixed findings on this. Uh, some, reaches of, uh, some researchers have found that if you increase the spacing of repeated tests, it had more effect. Um, but others have found that it didn't make any difference, so the jury's still out on whether that matters. Um, but splitting the test into smaller chunks uh, would work better because of that mass test effect. It's better to split up your testing of yourself. And with regard to the external feedback, um, there are other things that are influencing the effect as well, making sure that the feedback that the student gets is non-threatening. Uh, so having to put your hand up in front of your classmates is more threatening than, say, if you're working in private and maybe you're working with a computer-based system and you're able to make a stupid mistake without showing to everybody else that you've done so. Um, if you're familiar with John Paddy's research, you'll know that um, making feedback relevant and focusing on what to do next is important. Uh, it's helping to keep students in that um, zone of proximal development and whether learners engaged in problem solving but with the assistance of a uh, teacher or a, an aide uh, is able to make it to the next level. Um, and providing worked examples can be helpful because it gives a clearer picture of what is expected in their own learning and mastery of the topic uh, that they're studying. So uh, there's quite a lot more that you could say about feedback, but um, I want to give you some time for questions. Um, just to sum up, though, on, on this part, um, so the implications for teaching, uh, these studies support the use of embedded assessment. That's assessment of the material uh, that has just been covered. Uh, it supports embedded assessments that really engage the students in recall of what they've learned, um, using short written response type items that require a student to synthesize their learning. Um, for example, uh, in a study that I was involved in uh, that was looking at learning uh, how, how and why things sink or float, uh, we repeatedly posed the question throughout the embedded assessment of why do things sink or float? And over time, they got progressively more complex and detailed in their response to that. Um, so for, for individual students who are studying as well, 
uh, it really supports testing themselves instead of just rereading the material. And teachers might be able to provide uh, questions that a student could ask um, of themselves uh, to support that kind of use. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I think we've just scratched the surface here. Um, if you're interested in uh, what the Science of Learning Research Centre is doing, uh, we have a website, uh, we have an email. If you want to just bring me a business card, uh, I can make sure you get added to our mailing list. Um, but we're happy to uh, answer questions. I think we, uh, yeah, we've got uh, quite a few more minutes to answer questions. Thank you. of how the world works because we live and exist in the world. 
Um, there was a study recently um, where they looked at experts and novices um, as they were engaging with some science misconceptions. Um, and what they found was that in the brain, there was, a, there was a, an electroencephalograph study, an EEG study of the brain, and the areas of the brain that are involved in suppressing were active in the experts as they were working with materials. And it's as if um, you learn like the, the correct scientific conception, but the naive, erroneous one never goes away, but experts get good at suppressing it and replacing it with the, with the expert one. And I, I know, you know that people find it really hard to get rid of those naive conceptions and there's all those studies of um, you know, Harvard graduates and phases of the moon and that kind of thing where even well-educated people still have misconceptions about um, you know, physical science. And, uh, so that, that was an interesting thing recently that I saw. I'm not sure if you're, if you're focusing on a particular kind of learning um, in terms of recall or memory. I'm thinking now in terms of you know, perhaps other kinds of learning like inference and even creating kinds of learning. Can you comment about the applicability of what you're talking about today? Yeah, I think one of the issues that we have is that uh, cognitive science in particular struggles to examine those type of processes they tend to be more complex and don't. Certainly, there are people looking at them. And, you know, how do we do that type of inferential processing? It has been of great interest to problem neuroscience in particular. But there are methodological issues that we have in trying to understand them. But certainly, um, invariably, the principles that I'm talking about do apply. But necessarily, how they apply is not currently well understood. So even the difference between associative type learning that I'm primarily focusing on here and um, you know, more elaborate strategic processing that occurs, you know, there isn't as good of an understanding, um, but the general principles should still apply. Yeah, we looked at uh, things like uh, learning difficulties is the same process happening or is there a part of that process that's interrupted and, and that's why the week will become so hard for some students? Yeah, so I mean there's a wealth of research looking at different uh, groups in terms of the only issues they bring to the learning process. Uh, they tend to break into two things. So in dyslexia there's a perceptual processing issue before you even get to the learning stage. So the way in which the Processing the, the information coming in via the retina is different to the way people who don't have to study it. And, and so that in, interferes with the learning process itself. Um, whereas, for example, we know in uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, for example, the, um, at the neurochemical level, the amount of dopamine they are actually producing interferes with the types of attention errors that I was talking about before. Um, they are, in some ways, like Drug dependence, there's not enough dopamine in the brain parts of the human brain. They don't produce as good a prediction error. The error signal that each of us has when we become aware of our own mistake isn't as strong or as clear uh, as healthy, you know, non clinical samples. Uh, and one of the things, for example, that Ritalin and Methylphenidate does is to actually normalize that signal in the human brain. Uh, but why? Why that occurs in the first place isn't exactly clear, and all of the ways that it interferes with the learning process are understood. Definitely, are interested in that. We also know, for example, in ADHD, that awareness of their own errors is nowhere near as good for these basic kind of neuroscientific reasons. That they need more assistance in detecting mistakes in their performance, and that is by itself interfering. With them. If you're not detecting your mistakes, you're not able to adapt to change. Uh, one of our partners in the Science of Learning Research Centre is at the uh, Institute of Education at the University of London, um, Brian Butterworth. He's done some work on dyscalculia, um, doing neuroimaging of brains of people with dyscalculia and without. And 
Um, it's fairly clear now you know, which regions of the brain are engaged when you're dealing with mathematical uh, material. And what Brian has found is that those areas of the brain can be smaller in people with dyscalculia and they have fewer um, neural connections in those areas. So there's, sort of, there's some physical differences there which are impeding their ability to uh, understand numeracy. So they don't do well on um, tests of numeracy, just basic sort of recognition of like, you know, there's a group of five things versus a group of six things. Um, but there's uh, research that he's done that you could find if you wanted to look for Brian Butterworth. Thank you very much for your attention.